Thank you. A great pleasure, uh, a great honor to be here. Yeah. Um, first and foremost, I wanted to thank the college and all, all the staff, administration, faculty, and students to make this evening possible. It certainly goes without saying, but it bears repetition that uh, events like these are always the outcome of an enormous amount of hard, invisible work. Nobody ever applauds it, but it always happens. And it always makes these evenings possible. We are always the beneficiary of it, even though it passes usually without notice. And I wanted to thank you all for that. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank the president for the wonderful and most generous uh, introduction. So thank you so much. And to your president, so you should clap way louder than you clap before. <laughs> and we, I say this stuff to the people. It's kind of like this stuff. I'm from a, a again, it's, it's a weird thing. It's hard for me to claim this because I spent so many years pretending and hiding from it. But I'm from like a deeply military family. Everybody in my family, except for me and my little sister, and we were five siblings, was in the military. Yeah? But there's some weird, strange customs that end up making sense in the regular world. And one of those is when strangers come into the house, no matter what your deal is, you always got to clap for your captain as hard as possible. Yeah? So it's an important one. I had to learn that from my family when I went to college and I realized stuff I should know. Besides, if your president's around, you always got to figure out a way, if you're one of the students, to have a conversation with him. Yeah? That way you can squeeze for the letter in a couple of years. <laughs> Guys, this is the way it works in the real world. Man. Yeah. And most of all, I wanted to thank you all for being here this evening. I uh, appreciate you spending time with us. Uh, there's uh, a million things to be doing, a million things plus, and it's very kind of you spend a little time with us. Yeah? I um, wanted to begin my comments uh, mostly around uh, the mission of Cambridge College and sort of how it intersects a bit with my own um, sort of biography. I am an immigrant. I am from the Dominican Republic. I am from sort of a, a working poor community from central New Jersey, if anyone knows Jersey at all. Is anybody here from Jersey? One, damn it, that's a half. Is that the full? Where in Jersey? Oh yeah, of course, right up the road from my mom lives. Yeah, my mom's at Ridgefield Park now. Okay, yeah, so if you knew New Jersey, I'm from right where Chris Amboy is. And, um, I did not come from a college family, as you might imagine. Um, me and my sister were the first people in our family to graduate from high school, forget college. You know, uh, the entire history of our family. Um, and um, certainly, we were also um, part of that segment of college kids that most of the time we don't hear about and yet makes up a large portion of people going to college, which is uh, folks who work their way through college. I went through first Kane College, a small state school in New Jersey, and then transferred to Rutgers. And the entire five years that I was in college, I had a full-time job. Yeah. I was sort of one of those kids who I used to remember looking longingly at my peers who would go on sort of uh, spring breaks and go on vacations and go out to parties while I was going to go check into my job. Uh, the entire time I had worked um, delivering pool tables, and it was just uh, a less than fun job. I do not recommend it. If you've ever tried to move a pool table, you might see why. You know, a couple thousand pounds. And, um, and it's actually, I, I can't think of something harder and something that we don't give enough credit for 
is what it takes to be able to sustain yourself under the multiple and simultaneous labor of having a job and attempting to go to school while you have the job. I mean, when I look back at my challenges, and I've written three books, yeah. Um, again, immigrant, had to go through that, all that fun immigrant stuff that immigrants tend to have to go through. I would probably rank graduating from college by far the most difficult thing that I ever did, the greatest challenge that I ever faced. And perhaps the journey which most challenged me and which I nearly did not prove its equal. I think that often when we think about sort of kind of leadership speakers or speakers about, you know, you trust someone up to talk to you about what they've done and what they've accomplished, uh, often enough, not enough stress and emphasis is placed on our failures, our endless debilitating failures. Um, and the amount of that failure costs and how it weighs upon you. Both failure as a real event in one's life and as a possibility. Because if you came up in a family like mine, where we grew up, we were so poor, plenty of people poor, plenty of people less poor, but in the context of our community, we were pretty damn poor. The, the margin of error was incredibly thin. There was almost no room, no safety valve, no backstop. Yeah. One week without a paycheck, and that was it for paying for college for that semester. Yeah. Two days sick consecutively, and that was it for my finishing my major in time. Yeah, forget any kind of medical insurance. We certainly didn't even have the rumor of Obamacare. But I think many people understand this situation and understand the enormous challenges that face students in a culture like ours that so fetishizes success and so fetishizes the wealthy and so fetishizes consumption, in other words, what you can buy, and yet does very little to support its students. And I came out of that world as much as you're a part of that world. And for me, when I think about that, what was extraordinary wasn't how exceptional I was. It wasn't how smart I was. And it certainly wasn't how favored I was. What struck me more than anything is how poorly resourced I was and how often I gave up. Um, you know, it's easy to say once you've eaten that you've been hungry. But sometimes one needs to recall that there has been hunger because those who eat have a way of distorting the record. And now, for me, my four years, you guys, was really in many ways, and a litany of giving up. I couldn't stop just losing it. Because it takes, takes a lot, man, to have a job going. It takes a lot. For many of us, we're our parents' parents. I don't know if anybody has that situation where you're the immigrant, but you're the one who does all the translating. You're the one who does all the negotiation. You're their agent. You're their realtor. You're their lawyer. You're their advocate. Yeah, and oftentimes you're the damn therapist. Yeah, there's all of these demands that your family life put on you, all the demands the job put on you, and all the demands, of course, then, that is required to be an alert, attentive, participant, present student. And it's a lot more than most of us give it credit for. When I was going through school, I had no idea that I had these burdens on me. I just assumed it was like everyone else. You're just like the old joke, right, where the one donkey in encounters the other donkey, and the one donkey has got like a trunk on its back, and the first donkey has got like six cars piled on it, and the donkey with the trunk says, my God, what a big load you got. And the donkey with the six cars piled on it says, what load? 
Now, if you grew up the way I did, you had no idea what was happening to you. You just assumed this was the commonplace that you just did it. But when I look back at that time, and I look back at how often I kind of just, you know, as in lack of better terms, I kind of fucked everything up. I kind of was demotivated in ways that made me give up, you know, in ways that sort of made me sort of question what the hell I was doing. What really kind of struck me was that now, when I look back, is that in some ways, some of you are probably wiser and have already figured out that there are certain things that help us in situations of great stress, in situations of great challenge. Yeah? One of those things is, of course, what happens. Has anybody ever been in law school? Now, anyone in law school? I've never been in law school, but everybody around me has been in law school. My sister's in goddamn law school. My ex-girlfriend is in law school. My girlfriend is a lawyer. My best friend is a lawyer. It's like everybody's a lawyer. Well, one of the things that happens in law school, you guys, is that they force you to learn as a group. You come together as a cadre, and that cadre stays together the entire three years you're there. Why? Because community and collective strangely enough, make difficult, trying conditions like those that I face far easier to cope with. Most of us are more isolated than we should be when we're students. Most of us are more isolated than we should be when we're doing anything. And if I have to think what kept picking me the hell up and what kept me going, it was never my genius and it was never my hard work and it was never a felicitous turn of good luck, and it was never some sort of internal grit that I carried inside of me. It was the fact that I had collected, and that every time things fell apart for me, other people helped me pick it up. And had I been more aware of that, I think I would have worked harder to increase the amount of community as a resource that I had. And that often, most of us, if you're like me, you're, when you're in trouble, you kind of think of that old traditional masculine ideology of like, I don't want to bother other people, and I got to gut this shit out myself. But alas, 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 that impulse is the worst possible one. And when I think about myself now, reaching back to try to talk to my past person, my past self, my younger self, I would advise my younger self always that community. Instead of running away and thinking that you've got to do it yourself, you, despite the fact that you feel like you don't have any resources for you, you've got to go out of your way to make more community. The worse you feel, the more you need to throw yourself out and try to make new friends. It's completely counterintuitive. Most of us think we should only make friends as an excess, as a surplus. We're feeling great, and therefore, we need to reach out. The opposite seems to be true. The more community you have, the better resource you are. Yeah. I think the second and certainly uh, vital element of thinking about my journey from what started out as an immigrant kid, a kid who came from a family that, as you can imagine, my family did not have being an artist on the schedule. <laughs> we were five kids being raised by my mother, primarily on welfare. Yeah. My mother, you cannot raise five kids and have no job without some sort of public assistance. My mother was raising these five kids. My mother was an eminently practical woman. Yeah? She, in her mind, you didn't come from the Dominican Republic. You didn't come to a new world. You didn't endure all the things that we had to endure to get an education so that the kids could go and become artists. My mother's expectations for us, like I said, were deeply practical. She expected us to be doctors, Engineers. Back then, there was like no computer science. My mom now, if my mom was growing up now, she probably would have been like doctor, engineer, computer science. But back then, she was like doctor, engineer, and lawyer. Yeah. And growing up in a family that expected these things and that had real guys practical needs, it wasn't just my mom's practical sort of outlook. It was the fact that like if you're poor, the last thing you want your kids to do is to do something as abstract and as weirdly unreliable as become artists. 
I mean, when I told my mother that I was going to be an artist, I always say this, but it's true. My mother, my poor mother, doesn't speak a word of English, didn't get past third grade. My poor mother just about herself. <laughs> she could not believe it. In her mind, that was like a crime beyond all crimes. She's like, as we would say in Spanish, she's like, este muchacho, medio inteligente. Lo quiere perder todo con esa mierda de artista. You know? Long way of saying, this kid ain't half dumb. I can't believe he's wasting his life on this art crap. Yeah? And if you came from that kind of background, a background where arts was not only not a part of the formula, it was unimaginable. The part of me that starts in this world and gets to here has to go through another challenge of which I speak of, which is something I always say to my students, I call the lash. Yeah? The lash is what makes it possible for those of us who are under enormous amount of stress to get our work done. What makes it possible for somebody who has a full-time job to still come to classes and kick ass. What makes it possible for you to be a mother, to have children, to work, and still take classes. That makes it possible for you to be taking care of a sick family member, yeah, work, and come to classes at night. That make it possible for people like us, people who aren't part of the formula. We are not what is expected when the word success comes up. We are not what is expected when the word perseverance comes up. Most of us faces are never going to be in a dictionary to underline the important values of society. Because for most of us, our society tends not to think of us at all. If you come from this world, what does it take to get to where you want? Often what you do is you apply the lash. And what I mean by that is that you use will and force and the desire to get ahead, to push yourself beyond exhaustion, beyond hours, beyond challenges, beyond costs. You push yourself beyond realism because it's almost not real for someone who's a single mother and a job taking care of kids to come and get classes and kick ass. You push yourself beyond the limits of the imaginable. And you do so by denying yourself, by pushing yourself, by not tolerating any excuses with yourself, by not being particularly gentle with yourself, by applying the lash. So when I think of myself, when I was your age, when I think of myself when I was at school, when I think of myself going through these years of difficulty and challenge, what I was really, really good at, you guys, was pushing myself in the cruelest ways possible, was being exceptionally mean to myself to get things done. If there was a paper due, I could go without sleep. I had almost no compassion for myself. I would just apply the lash. And what this often means to so many of us is that so many of us can get through school, can get to law school, get our degrees, can get what we want, and have never practiced any kind of compassion towards ourselves. I graduated from Rutgers in four years after one year at King College, driving myself to the edge of madness. And when I did it, on the one hand, it was a victory. But on the other hand, in the entire four years that I did it, I had never been compassionate. The only thing I knew to how to deal with a problem is that a problem would come, and I would put the whip on myself. And I would force myself to face it. I would force myself not to sleep. I would force myself not to dream. I would force myself not to eat. I could force myself to not go with money. I could force myself to do all sorts of things. 
And in the short term, that's not a terrible strategy. In the long term, it makes it impossible for you to be a human. Without, without, without a practice of compassion towards yourself, without even understanding what compassion is operationally, Look, that I could get out of Rutgers, a safe New Jersey State College, four years, and not be able to really define compassion speaks to what most of us face in this culture. And I would argue that if I had to speak to my younger self, which is really what you're overhearing here, is a conversation across time and space. Yeah? If I had to speak to my younger self to sort of give him a cheat sheet of what would make the kind of healthy success that I imagine most of us want. Because I don't think people just want what they want and to be unhappy. I don't think you want your degree or your house or you want your new job and you want to be depressed and miserable. I think you want those things and you want to feel a great sense of self. You want to feel that you belong to yourself. You want to feel that when you think of joy, you begin with you. To achieve that, I would say to my younger self, first and foremost, the practice of compassion is not just necessary, it is essential. And it would be wise for those of us who are students to try to figure out ways to begin to practice it now. Because to learn to be compassionate to yourself when times are hard is, again, counterintuitively, the best and easiest way. Learning compassion after the fact is very difficult. And any of you who are as old as I am, past their mid-40s, understand that what we wrestle with in life tends less to be about those outer challenges that oppress us so much, and more about those inner challenges that follow us, whether we are undergraduates, whether we are graduates, whether we're MIT professors, whether we're writers, whether we're lawyers. And to my younger self, but to you, I would simply say, first and foremost, ask yourself, young Juno, and anyone else who feels that this might pertain to them, what is your practice of compassion. What does this mean? Where have you seen compassion happen? And why is it possible for people to graduate from four-year colleges and not have an operational definition of compassion? To be successful, whether one is a student, no matter what the setback, and no matter if you're like me and you give up a lot, or you're like other people and you give up not at all, community and compassion form the cornerstone of any successful practice. And I'll leave it there. And I'll take some questions. So you can clap with a day's look. <laughs>